I'm Joe Bob Briggs, and I thought that perhaps this evening you would like to hear me give my explanation of the second law of thermodynamics, because both Monster Vision movies are adaptations of the famous H.G. Wells novel, The Time Machine. The first feature is the classic Oscar-winning Time Machine, starring Rod Taylor. After that, we have the funkier version, the one with Malcolm McDowell and Mary Steenburgen, time after time. But in both cases, we're dealing with a fourth dimension paradox. Namely, if you get forward in time and get killed, then how did you go forward in the first place? Because you never existed at the point where you started. And if you go backward in time and kill your grandfather, then how are you ever born? See Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs next on TNT. All right, put on that rubber bullwinkle life vest. It's time for the annual Joe Bob Briggs Summer Vacation Guide. And actually, before we start, I should mention that this is H.G. Wells' night with not one, but two movies based on his classic novel, The Time Machine. First, The Time Machine, where Rod Taylor takes a little vacation on New Year's Eve 1899 and goes 800,000 years into the future. And then, Time After Time, where H.G. Wells chases Jack the Ripper in 1979 San Francisco. Okay. It's Memorial Day weekend, time to start planning your summer. Our first vacation destination is the General Elmo Randolph Lincoln Reservoir and Dam. This out of the way fun spot just off State Route 22, south of Selma, Alabama, is maintained by District 13, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for your boating and swimming pleasure. But plan to stay an extra day or two for side trips to the vulcanized zinc pottery factory in Gastonburg and, of course, the ruins of Old Junius. Now, the ruins date from, uh, 20, from uh, May 23rd, 1957, which was the day the Corps first released water from the dam and forgot that Junius, an 87-year-old mule skinner, was still sleeping in his prefab fishing shack located in a part of the floodplain they just forgot to mark on the map. So pay the two extra bucks. I would recommend this for the glass bottom boat ride. And look closely at the famous mystery window of old Junius. Is that an eyeball or just a finger? Families have been arguing about it for years. Our second vacation spot is the Long and Slippery Water Amusement Park. Now, you know that long stretch between uh, Salina, Kansas and Lincoln, Nebraska? Right in here, the one where the kids always play the Let's Scare Daddy game? Well, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Just veer off right here on US 136, head over to Red Cloud, Nebraska, turn right at the Bo Diddley Pioneer Museum, and say to anybody on the street, we're looking for long and slippery. And they'll take you to the world's most disgusting mudslide, courtesy of the Webster County Irrigation District, which opened for business in 1983 with the slogan, Will Tucker, the Little Suckers Out. Parents can stay next door at the Dirt Plaza, watch any cable movie free that has the word hookers in the title. And then my final suggestion would be, uh, now this is, this is only for your serious vacationers, but this is canoeing the tittleluck. Pay and pack an extra thermos for this one. First, what you do is you, get, you, you head 400 miles north of Fairbanks, Alaska, up in this direction here. Take a left at Dead Horse. If you get all the way over here to the Beaufort Sea, you've gone too far. Ask for a guy, guy named Nunchuck at the last liquor store on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and tell him you're ready to shoot the tittleluck. Also say the following words, Joe Bob expects his. Don't worry what those words mean. It just means that you'll get the real Eskimo treatment. Okay, next week, dude ranches. And speaking of traveling, Rod Taylor is about to ride his little Santa Claus sled to the year 802,701, give or take, where a bunch of Aryan zombies are being bred for lunch by the ugly pus monsters who live underground, and nobody at home in 1900 will believe him, including his friends Mr. French from Family Affair and Wilbur from Mr. Ed. Or as Mr. Ed used to call him, Wilbur. Let's do the drive-in totals and get it started. We have... Six dead bodies, no breasts, cigar transport, Victorian scientist transport, millennial reveling, A-bomb stock footage, spontaneous lava flow, whitewater body surfing, talking bracelets, kung fu, morlock fu. Those of you who have seen the movie, you know what that is. I give it about three stars. Check it out. And don't forget, after this, Jack the River rides the sled again in time after time. Okay, roll it. Also starring Yvette Mimuse as a futuristic bimbo with a permanent wave. Is she a zombie, or did she just grow up in the 50s? You decide. <laughs> 
Joe Bob, I saw this movie in 1984, and it had a girl in it, and she's sitting by this tree. What movie was that? People, we have got to have more information than that when you're submitting something for the Find That Flick contest. Now, normally, if you give me a plot description, I will know the title of the movie you're trying to remember. But if I can't answer it, hundreds of my fellow drive-in mutants can, because I got fans that watch 32 movies a day. They never leave their apartments. So to find out how to play and all the free junk you can win, visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision and look for the Find That Flick contest. Joe Bob, I saw this movie with a talking bear in it and Morgan Fairchild naked. See, that's a description I can work with. Visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. This TNT presentation is brought to you by The Bat Blue, Pure Canada. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. That H.G. Wells was a long-winded SOB, wasn't he? These things are always so talky at the beginning. And he wastes a perfectly good cigar. How could Sebastian Cabot let that happen? No wonder he's so dang cranky. Am I the only one who thinks he seems a little irritable in this movie? And not only does Rod Taylor break the cigar in three parts, he sends it off into the future where 90% of the places you go don't allow smoking. <laughs> Which reminds me, the cigar doesn't have the ability to pull the little lever back to turn the little time machine off, so where does the cigar stop? Does it just go on into the future forever? What if the universe expands or contracts or whatever Einstein said it's gonna do and the space doesn't exist anymore? Does the cigar crash into something? Or is H.G. Wells, who wrote the novel this is based on, postulating that time is infinite? And more importantly, why did Rod Taylor just put on a smoking jacket? Is he gonna take another time machine and go find the cigar? <laughs> All right, well, let's find out when we roll the film. And by the way, did you guys recognize Wilbur? <laughs> He's the sensitive, red-headed guy, Philby, played by Alan Young, best known these days as the voice of Scrooge McDuck. Does a lot of the same cartoons that Mark Hamill does. Two of them are probably having lunch right now. Well, they're kind of late for lunch, I guess, but I bet they know each other, and you guys don't care, do you? As I was saying, a cigar propelled infinitely through time becomes not just a cigar, but a transcendental object with some degree of immortality. Unless you smoke it, of course, then it's trash. Rusty the Mail Girl here, inviting you to visit our Monster Vision website. This is the place to get the scoop on zombies, ghouls, road warriors, or whatever happens to be the late-breaking story on this week's show. Check out our Playmate of the Week, or try your luck at the Monster Vision Caption Contest and win a free T-shirt. Or visit Joe Bob's Mailbag page where you can see your favorite Fan Mail of the Week. To find us on the Internet, go to tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. I'll be waiting. Visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. Okay, believe it or not, those were Oscar-winning special effects. Pretty impressive, aren't they? Remember, this movie was made in 1960 when time-lapse photography of flowers blooming was considered revolutionary. Or maybe there just wasn't a lot of competition that year. So anyhow, I thought this, this would be a good time to demonstrate how scientists today think time travel could be possible. And to help me out, because it's a holiday weekend and there's no mail this weekend, is the relaxed and rusted Rusty, the TNT mail girl. And, oh, I see Regal Lanes was open. That's good. No, actually, they weren't. And Billy says you owe him a six-pack. Well, tell him I'll buy it with the 200 pesos he still owes me from the last poker night. Here, grab it into this. Okay. All right, this sheet represents space-time. Now, don't ask me exactly what space-time is. Let's just say that when you put space and time together, you get space-time. So, you see a couple of uh, uh, tennis balls there? Oh, yes. All right, grab those. Now, roll one of those tennis balls on this uh, space-time. Okay. Okay. Now, see what it does? See how the ball distorts the sheet when it rolls to the center? Mm -hmm. That represents matter distorting space-time. Now, roll the other <laughs> ball on there. Okay, see? The other ball is dragged <laughs> toward the first ball because the first ball distorted the space-time. Now, take out the tennis balls and put the bowling ball on there. 
I don't right. think I can hold the sheet and put a bowling ball on it. All right, I'll do it. All right. So now we have... All right, hold tight. Now watch how the bowling ball distorts the space-time. Ready? Okay. Hold tight. Yeah. <gasps> okay, see, it rolls right to the uh, center of space-time. Whoops! <laughs> Sorry. No, that was supposed to happen, just not in that particular way. But do you know what that is? A hole? A, bl a black hole? Yes, it's a black hole, exactly. And if you look at it from the other side, what is it? It's a white hole. Maybe even a wormhole. So now, a bunch of American and Russian scientists, they got together and they decided that if you use gravity to tow one mouth of the wormhole until it rests up against the other end, I'd say, I'd say well, go ahead, Rusty, take this. This represents the wormhole. Now, feed that through there. Feed that through the black hole. No, other way. Other way. you got to feed it through the black hole. Oh, all right. All right, don't think about it, guys. All right, feed it through there, and uh, that a time traveler who jumped into one mouth would come out the other end of the wormhole at a different time because time is the physical property of each wormhole mouth. So you see, if this is the wormhole, this is the black hole, this is space-time. So see, there's a disparity in space-time between the two mouths. How do you use gravity to tow a hose? It's not a hose. It's a wormhole. I don't get it. Well, I'm glad I ripped up my bed sheet for this. This is a sheet off of your bed? Well, oh, yeah. I need to go wash my hands right now. <laughs> All right. Don't you want me to explain the granny paradox? No! Because there's just no sense of intellectual curiosity around here. It's because the granny paradox... Well, okay, we'll do that later. What would you do for a Monster Vision t-shirt? Never mind, don't tell me I've already seen some of your propositions. Well, I'll make it easy for you. Try to win one through our Monster Vision Caption Contest. All you have to do is make the six-headed jury laugh. To try, just go to tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Go on, try it. And when you get your t-shirt, take a picture of yourself in it and send it to me. I'll put it where I put all my fan mail. And wouldn't you like to know where that is? Play the Monster Caption Contest and win a free t-shirt at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. Some more of those mind-boggling special effects in that last part. It's hard to believe this movie was made 40 years ago, isn't it? How do they do that thing with the mannequin changing clothes like that, you know? Are we supposed to believe that the place across the street remained a dress store for at least 100 years with the same mannequin in the same place? Uh, okay. <laughs> this flick was directed by George Powell, and three other movies that he produced got Oscars for special effects also. Destination Moon, When Worlds Collide, and War of the Worlds, which was another H.G. Wells story. George Powell is the guy who thought up the idea for Puppetoons, which were those cartoons made with stop-motion puppets. And uh, he made a ton of those in the 40s. Then he got into the sci-fi invasion movies of the 50s. In fact, the flick we're watching now is full of that 50s paranoia, which is totally different from the book. But we'll get to that later, because I don't want to give anything away. Okay, back to the flick. And by the way, shouldn't Rod Taylor have some kind of Victorian English accent in this? Sometimes he sounds English, and sometimes he sounds like he's from the Hoosier State or something. <laughs> he's actually from Australia. He's like the Mel Gibson of the 50s and 60s. Kind of looks like Mel Gibson, too, now that I think about it. What's my point? I, I lost my point. Remember Rod Taylor in The Birds, though? Tippi Hedren had the hots for him, didn't she? And his name is Rod. <laughs> Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. The yummy Yvette Mimieu as Weena, looking very mannequin-like herself. Uh, ironically, one of the other movies that Yvette Mimieu did in 1960 was Where the Boys Are, which was written by George Wells. And this movie was written by George Wells, H. George Wells. No relation. So you know what that is? That's a fact that appears to have significance but has absolutely no meaning, which is what Monster Vision is all about, right? All right. Our favorite Yvette Mimieu flick around here is, of course, Jackson County Jail from 1976, co-starring Tommy Lee Jones, where Yvette gets thrown into a small-town southern jail where she's brutally raped by the sadistic 
redneck jail guard, and then she busts out and gets her revenge. Excellent Roger Corman produced flick from his golden era. Check that out. And uh, right now, though, let's get back to the movie because Rod Taylor's hacked off because all these kids do is swim and dance and play. Bad kids. And you know what the worst of it is? They don't take care of their books. And here it is Memorial Day, too. Let's observe a moment of silence for all the soldiers that we're honoring this weekend. Memorial Day is for soldiers, right? Memorial Day? Well, the word memorial is not much of a clue, all right? You know, there are a couple of you out there who followed me throughout my career. I know that because I see you lurking around in the bushes outside my bedroom. So you may know about the Find That Flick contest I used to run in the newspaper. Well, we've added it to the Monster Vision website, and I could waste your time explaining all the details of it, but just check it out. Test your horror flick knowledge and win a cheesy prize. Go to tnt.com forward slash Monster Vision and look for Find That Flick. And uh, stop following me throughout my career. You're really starting to get on my nerves, okay? <laughs> Visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. All right, make that blank stare work for you, girl. <laughs> I can see why Rod Taylor likes old Weena. That's just how I like them. Pretty self-sacrificing and dumb as a box of rocks. Honey, go on down to the 7-Eleven and get me some more of my medicine. And don't stick your hand in the fire, all right? I'd show her out of the dark ages anytime, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. So let's get back to the flick. And, uh, you know, a woman who doesn't know what the past or the future is, think about that. Because she'll never say, what girls were you with before me? Did you love her? <laughs> and she'll also never say, I want to talk about our future. <laughs> it's just like, would you like to have a picnic? <laughs> Where is Yvette? <laughs> She's still around, right? Hey, you know what? We want to give you some free junk we have laying around here. Do you realize just what links people will go to to get free junk? Find out by checking out the Monster Vision website. We have these weird contests like Find That Flick, the ever-popular caption contest where you try to make the six-headed jury laugh, and there's the Playmate of the Week setting new standards in what is considered beautiful. And then, scariest of all, we have viewer mail from the truly deranged. So go to tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision and try to realize every Webster's dream to act like a bigger idiot than yours truly, Joe Bob Briggs. There could be some free junk in it for you to clutter up your dresser drawer until it's time to move again. You have to throw it all out. Visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. So basically, Rod Taylor wants him to start another war. Is that about right? See, now that we got a little plot out of the way, I can talk about how they changed the story for the movie. The first thing you have to remember is that H.G. Wells was writing in the 1890s about a generation after Dickens, and he was a socialist sympathizer because all around him he saw the working classes being exploited and starving and working long hours, living in terrible housing conditions. Meanwhile, the rich industrialists and the people of leisure were living large. So H.G. Wells wrote this as a satire where the Eloi are the descendants of the leisured classes, who have become these brainless zombies who die young, and we'll see why in a minute. And the Morlocks are the descendants of the working classes who were driven into underground factories, but who now prey on the Eloy at night. But when they made the movie in 1960, they updated it, right? They dropped the whole class thing. They said that people choose whether to go underground or above ground, and they put all that war stuff into it. So, see, because, see, this was at the peak of the Cold War, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis right after the McCarthy era, when all the sci-fi flicks were about, like, invasions of giant red ants and stuff, you know, representing the commies. And, of course, in this flick, the attacks in the near future come from atomic satellites, or Sputniks. And the Eloi are like the rebellious youth of the era, you know? So, hedonists that need to be whipped into shape to defend their country. And the women, represented also by the mannequin and the housekeeper, are supposed to dress nice and get dinner on the table, so the feminists hate this flick almost as much as the liberals do. And I'm ruining the movie again, aren't I? All right, I'll shut up. Go. Oh, and you know what else makes them uh, mad? In the book, the Sphinx is white. 
But in the movie, the Sphinx is brown. People write whole academic papers on that one. We have one in the file. I read it. It came out a few years ago in the quarterly of the Salisbury State University. Not to be confused with the Salisbury Stake University. They don't write a lot of papers there, but... Think you're funnier than Joe Bob? Who isn't, right? But can you prove it? Then enter the Monster Vision Caption Contest and try to make the six-headed jury laugh. And no, I'm not one of the heads. What do you win if you slay them with your caption? How about this incredibly collectible T-shirt? To play, go to tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision and look for the Caption Contest link. And may the best man, woman, or mutant win. Everyone's eligible. Oh, except Joe Bob. We've heard enough from him, don't you think? Play the Monster Caption Contest and win a free T-shirt at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and the Time Machine on TNT. That part always gets to me, you know. I just feel like the proud papa when the Eloy kid with the bowl haircut makes his first fist and kills the Morlock, don't you? I, all they needed was for Rod Taylor to hand him a cherry lifesaver and I would have been a goner. That big Morlock fist fight looked pretty lame, though. <laughs> but I like the guy in the fire suit. I always like a good fire suit scene. Always comes down to cannibalism, doesn't it, in these movies? They were eating the Eloy. Soylent Green is people! Soylent Green... Oh, sorry. Carried away. Wrong movie. All right. Soylent Green. You know Soylent Green. All right. Time for the exciting not-by-the-book conclusion to The Time Machine. Roll it. Here comes a scene that really annoys the feminists because a male Eloy saves George. And now George and Weena talk about... Well, a balsam hair care products. You're not going to believe it. You'll see. Stay tuned for more Joe Bob Briggs on Joe Bob's Last Call. Coming up next on TNT. And now, Joe Bob's Last Call and time after time on TNT. Everything tied up very nicely there at the end. A very English ending, wasn't it? He has all the time in the world. Did you guys notice that scene, the feminist hate? It's the one where all Weena wants to talk about is hairstyles, and Rod Taylor calls his housekeeper old and useless. That really makes their blood boil. In the book, H.G. Wells has a manservant, and Weena dies. And then he goes 30 million years into the future where man is a little football-sized thing hopping around like a turtle with a couple of feet missing. Pretty bleak in the book, but actually, I would have liked to see that. Anyway, I want to let you know that next week we have Bridget Fonda in a mini dress running around killing people in Point of No Return, and the early Oliver Stone flick, The Hand, where Michael Caine's severed limb runs around killing people. Well, it doesn't run around. It, it crawls around, fingers around. Okay, I'm Joe Bob Briggs, and speaking of kinky... What if you fell in love with a guy, slept with him, and then found out he was H.G. Wells and he traveled to your apartment in a time machine? Sure, we've seen the story before, but have we seen it with Malcolm McDowell wearing a tweed suit the entire movie? I think not. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. Time after time, the story of what would happen if Jack the Ripper escaped the London police by jumping into his friend H.G. Wells' time machine and zapping himself to modern-day San Francisco, where one more serial killer is no big deal. Sounds like a comedy, right? But it's not exactly. This is actually one of the strangest movies ever made, which is why I kind of like it. It came out in 1979 and has built a little bit of a cult audience. And uh, I don't want to tell you a lot more about it except to say it's very well written. It's uh, written and directed by Nicholas Meyer, who did the same kind of movie when he made The 7% Solution, the one where Sigmund Freud meets Sherlock Holmes. And he also did Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which we showed here a few weeks ago. Gone! Gone! <laughs> Why do I do that? I blew out all my vocal cords doing that last time when we had the movie on. And um, Nicholas Meyer also wrote uh, Fatal Attraction. So anyhow, let's take a look at those drive-in totals. We have five dead bodies, cheesy time travel effects, pedestrian flipping, neck slashing, one motor vehicle chase, not a whole heck of a lot of numbers here because it's one of those talky flicks. They, they talk a lot in this movie. Three and a half stars, check it out, and I'll be sitting right here the whole time kibitzing as you watch the movie. Okay, roll it.
What does kibitzing mean? It's a Jewish thing, right? I didn't just say something disgusting, did I? I'm not gonna get a call Monday morning. Why did you tell people you were kibitzing during the movie? That's outrageous. Keep your kibitz where it belongs. <laughs>